So it's really peculiar when people ask, you know, what you do as a job or what, what your role is, what your title is, because everyone, I don't know, I know people seem to have this kind of obsession of what your title is, what's your job title, and I always, I always really struggle. In the evenings they use this space as a youth centre. And then I get given a nice little room in the back to do, to do my workshop stuff in. It's not very clean. So this is it. This is where everything happens. This is typically where most of my brewing goes on. And then food-wise we've got yeah, various jams and chutneys. So various skins that have been tanned to leather. And then just various bits and bobs that I've found around and about. Uh, I'm James Wood, a wild food forager. Um, I guess I've been foraging probably for about four years now. Foraging is the art of going out and collecting wild food, wild plants, connecting to landscapes, kind of understanding where people have come from, how people have hunted and gathered food before. But I think initially the word comes from bees, going out and collecting food. Because if you talk to anyone who's obsessed with bees, they always make the point if they come on foraging courses. Like foraging originated from bees. They always, they always tell you that. Yeah, James has been a really good person to know. He has got lots of skills and he's, he's got an en enjoyable way of life. He's done all, all sorts of crazy stuff. Yeah, my name's Freddie. We're at the uh, community garden in Bollington. English is Ale. I'm his brother, Bertie. Well, I've known Fred for ages. Going around pubs in Bolly, you just meet everybody and everybody kind of knows each other. He must have found out that I was doing some wild food stuff and was quite interested. And they've asked me various times to come on courses and kind of just go out and talk about certain plants with them. But more recently, Fred's kind of looked at setting up his own foraging company, in a sense. I mean, there could be, it could always be better, but I won't, I won't talk about the faults. So that's Dan, Slow, Gin, Chutney. It started off as just a preserves company. It gradually grew into something I decided to try and do properly. I still need to learn a lot about foraging, so hopefully James, James will be helping me out. So Fred and I haven't actually, although he's, we've, we've planned it there at various occasions to go out and do a proper forage, we've not officially gone out and done a big forage yet. I think we're going to go out around Wynancy, we might go to the wreck, collect some various plants actually, but hopefully we'll get wild garlic, nettles, hogweed, ground elder, bramble leaves, maybe some bramble stem, and then hopefully later we'll process all of this and make a, a wild garlic pesto. He did say a while back that he was debating, yeah, trapping some squirrels um, and going out and catching some rabbits. I've never hunted animals. Uh, I've eaten roadkill before. You see your badger and your, your fox don't taste great. I don't know how to explain it. You can kind of feel it on your breath when you're breathing out. I wouldn't, no, I wouldn't recommend it for everyone. No. So here we've got speared duck. Um, they actually used to traditionally use this for um, wrapping butter in. Really? Yeah, so they get butter, and I've got to these go to quite fair size. I think everyone would benefit from being outside more, in general. Uh, and foraging is just kind of an excuse to go out, go out for a walk. It's all there. It's stuff, you know, that people have been doing for millennia, but it's been kind of forgotten. But then, like I was saying, if you look from past cultures, it's totally normal. You know, why wouldn't you go out and collect your food from your doorstep? Yeah, foraging, I think, is popular. When you speak to people, you know, they're interested. They usually ask, like, oh, you know, what's going on, what are you doing? Uh, and then you kind of explain, you know, this is edible, you can eat this bit. And then typically they'll, they'll try it. You know, they don't know you, but they'll trust you enough to just try and eat a wild, you know, a wild berry or rose hips. So this is gorse. Uh, the only edible part, again, is the flower. And it's fairly small. It's really good for decoration on top of salads, on top of any food, really. Um, but also, Specifically, the wines. It's really good for yeah. wine making. Most of my family and friends, yeah, and my girlfriend. Uh, initially, when I started foraging, and some of the stuff I do they find really peculiar. My mum, typically, regardless of what I bring home and how nice it is, she'll always kind of turn a face at it. But then if I tell her you can buy it in stores and it's really expensive, she'll be like, oh, can you? Oh, I might, yeah, I might try a bit of that. Um, so, yeah, what we're picking here is wild garlic, uh, also called ramsons. It's probably one of the most easily, apart from nettles and dandelions, I'd say it's one of the most easily identifiable plants. 
you can, I mean, you can smell it typically when you just walk past it. And if you're still in a little bit of doubt, you can just pick a bit up and you just give it a crack, you can just, and the, the smell of garlic is just, it's so intense, it's unbelievable. Yeah, this is mine and Bert's house. Oh, parents' house. Parents' house. So, what we're going to cook with all this kind of produce we've collected, we're going to make a wild garlic and nettle pesto. We'll probably mix that with some Parmesan cheese, and then we're going to cook up some pasta. Uh, and then I think also, well, we'll mix the two of those together, and I think we might have some chicken with it. I thought that, yeah, no, I think it's, you know, it's got a flavour that you can't really taste anywhere else. There's something about it, I think. Yeah, definitely. That's really nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go down a treat. So cheers to a to a good day, Sparky. <laughs> so do you think you're going to use this on the allotment? Yeah, I think it'd be. Um, yeah. Can you imagine like some greens that you put in there that you're growing at the moment? Yeah. Well, the, uh... So the future for me, hopefully, the rest of my life will be spent doing something connected to outdoors and nature. And I think there was something re recent, maybe last year, that I read about wild mushroom foraging got quite big in Scotland people would take it, I think they were starting to take it too far, so they'd go into a forest and there'd be like 10 of them and they'd literally gut the forest of chanterelle mushrooms. I'd say that's very destructive, you know, because you're just taking everything. Whereas on a smaller scale for individuals, you know, if you're going out and foraging a little bit here and a little bit there, I guess it could actually be almost productive. You know, you're involved with the environment and therefore you're more likely to look after it.